Well, the Bermuda Reinsurance Conference. My name is uh, Tulfi Garib. I'm a reinsurance specialist at Standard & Poor's in North America. I have the privilege to be moderating the CEO panel this morning during the next hour. I will uh, start with the polling question addressed to the audience. And based on that first question, uh, best, uh, the answers to that first question, we're going to base our discussion at least for the first uh, few minutes. <clears throat> I will also uh, provide, uh, leave about five minutes to, towards the end of the panel for questions from the audience uh, using the mic, but also during the, our conversation for the next hour, you can text me uh, through the Pigeon Hall uh, uh, website. So uh, let me first introduce our esteemed panelists. To my left is Mark Grandison, the Chief Operating Officer of uh, Arch Capital, who uh, will be the CEO of Arch uh, coming uh, first quarter of next year after the retirement of uh, Mr. Dino is or, or Nadu. Yep. To his left is Mike McGavick, the Chief Executive Officer of Excel Catlin uh, Group. And to his left is uh, Kevin O'Donnell, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Renaissance Ray. So let me turn around to the audience and ask uh, the first question. I hope by now you have uh, logged in to uh, the Pigeon Hall uh, website. And the first question is given the magnitude of the cat losses year to date, uh, has the insurance pricing cycle finally reached? inflection point. So you have three, uh, three answers to choose from. The first one is basically the reinsurance price increases will be limited to the U.S. Uh, prop cap market. Uh, the second question you can choose from is in addition to the U.S. prop cap market, do you think that there would be a spillover effect to the global prop cap market? And the last question is basically you think that all global you know, uh, lines of business will be stabilized and likely strengthened in terms of pricing in the immediate to the near term on average. So we'll have about you know, five to 10 seconds to respond and then we'll, uh, we'll see the answers and then we'll follow up with the, our conversation with our esteemed panelists. This is a test. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see the results. All right, it looks like the, uh, if I read, it keeps changing, so. Uh, All right, it seems that there is 47% uh, uh, of the audience thinks that uh, the price increases will only affect the US prop cap market. Uh, by 29%, uh, there will be some spillover to the rest of the world. And 25% think, you know, it would be stabilization of all lines of business and potentially uh, strengthening of, uh, of the reinsurance pricing over the uh, immediate to uh, the short term. So with that, you know, feedback from the audience, let me start with maybe Mike. How <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I, I'm tempted to do a show of hands because I'm suspicious with these numbers. There's a lot of brokers in the room. Uh, <laughs> And certainly not a lot of Excel underwriters, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> look, our, our view is quite simple. Uh, when you have a product that has been chronically underpriced over multiple years, events like this are going to cause an awakening amongst the underwriting community that will change things, and change things, I think, in some cases, fairly dramatically. Um, the way the question is asked is really, how far will it spread from the place of direct connection? And while clearly I think the effect lessens the further from the core event, I don't think that means it's nothing. Um, I, I personally believe that the last answer was largely what I'm seeing in the market. That is to say, certainly there'll be the most impact on loss affected accounts. Second, there'll be the, most, the second most impact in loss impacted zones. But I also believe that the uh, process of underwriting that was called how much less than the 10% off that was requested can I get is over. I think underwriters are awake to the fact that they were selling their product for less than its real cost. And once they're awake to that fact, they don't go back, at least not for a while. So I think the market has changed more than this poll reflects. And I'm expecting results like that more than likely. Now it's a market. There'll be lots of different puts and takes. And the most important thing I would say to you is this. When we came into these storms, I think the common wisdom was the first and next big event would be the big test for the alternative capital market. I actually think it's turned out that it's the reverse. 
This now is a big test for the traditional reinsurance market. Can it, in fact, respond to loss? Can it get to the levels of prices that are needed to offset a period of dramatic loss? Will entrants that left be allowed back in um, and take over relationships that went through the hard times? These are going to be really fascinating questions. They don't fall on the alternative capital market. They'll be there, I believe. They fall on the traditional market much more so. Um, so I, I agree with what Mike is saying. I actually look at the poll results, and I think it supports my belief and Mike's belief that those that are most affected are easiest to see where prices will change. As you move further away, it's more difficult. And that's kind of what the poll showed, is as you move further away, you're taking more risk in predicting the market response. I believe that the market is changing. So I think we are moving to a more mature footing as an industry where we're going to see a secular shift towards efficiency and more stable margins. But whenever the cost of goods is not known, and risk by definition means more, than, um, more things than can happen than will, we don't know what will happen, so we have to price it in a way where it's, there's uncertainty. Whenever there's uncertainty in a cost of goods, there's going to be a cycle. Now, all financial markets have them. It's my belief that the cycles will look different. They'll probably be of a different duration, potentially a different amplitude. I think what we saw in 2006 with price response to the 2005 earthquakes probably wasn't long-term helpful for the industry. And what we need to get to is some oscillation around a price that is intrinsically the right price for the risk that we're assuming. And I agree with Mike that in many sectors of our industry, that intrinsic price, the risk transfer that's being put to the capital, has been less than what is long-term sustainable. So I'm of a belief that the market change will be broad, but we're going to continue on a secular path to greater efficiency over time. Great, thank you. And Mark? Yeah, my answer is, uh, is a non-answer. The three of them, actually, are I would have voted for. I think it's a matter of timing. I think we're going to see first some price increase in the most affected areas. It will translate into a similar product, which might be international property cap, for instance. And eventually, it will also spill over, I believe, to other lines of business. The, there's no denying that it's, it's fatigue in the industry. I mean, as, un, as underwriters, we can you know, attest to that. You just alluded to that, Mike, is that, you know, it's been anemic returns for risks that we believe are, you know, we do the best we can. We work with our clients over time. But I do, I do believe there's fatigue right now, and there's a recognition that something has to change. Now, we have a unique opportunity as an industry to really make it better for the next, you know, several years. I'm not saying that we'll be overreacting, but I think there's going to be some reaction. And I think there's also a recognition from the community, from the buyers of insurance and reinsurance that there's probably need to be some correction. The, the second piece of that question is, I think there will be a change and shift in time over the three areas. Uh, the big question is, will it be enough to, to be a sustainable turn of the market? And that's really what remains to be seen. That's the one thing that I'm not sure uh, I have any visibility over. Great, and, and uh, Kevin, you think, you know, the, I mean, you, you mentioned about potentially different cycles and different, with different products, but you think you know, this potential rate increases would be short-lived, or is this something that the question is still out there? I think um, rates change every year, so I think it's one where I'm hopeful that we're on a path to, uh, reinsurance can respond very quickly, it takes longer for insurance to respond. I hope we're on a path where everybody's looking to a place for the industry, both insurance and reinsurance, to be at a better place. That may take time. I think there is, um, we will be patient. So if there are um, instances where we're on a longer path to rate, rate adequacy in a specific deal or with a specific customer, it's a strong relationship. I think that's a good part of the partnership. So I'm very open to having robust dialogues with our customers, and our underwriters are very open to, to working with them, to making sure that in, in a point where markets are changing, the pain of that change is shared, and hopefully we get to a longer-term sustainable place. Yeah. And Mike, you feel the same way? Yeah, I think that that's actually one of the most important things that will happen next. Um, and I think Kevin said it best of us, and that is this notion that we have a marketplace that's going to throw through a systemic shift. Um, alternative capital and the way in which it plays um, and traditional underwriting and the way in which they, re they interact. <clears throat> We've been saying all along um, that the old idea of you know, very good margins, like really good margins, then slowly tapering off, then going bad, then an event, then really good margins, this kind of violent cycle, 
is going to go away. And this is the inflection point at which we start working toward a much more sustainable price. And, and we have to, this is a period of education for underwriters, for brokers, for clients, that those days are gone. Don't expect this to just go ripping back down. We're going to start to try and be more precise over time, or else the market makes no sense any longer and capital is going to be withdrawn. So we're going to have to go through an education across the entire spectrum here to understand what this new market means. It can't play the way it did. It just won't. I think to be the one variable that we just talked about is the alternative capital and the alternative uh, you know, returns that people get in the market, specific in fixed income. So we might be in an inflection point you know, despite ourselves or in spite of ourselves because we may have some rate increase uh, in the Treasury in the U.S. that would actually make it a little bit more uh, interesting in terms of competing you know, returns in the industry. We've been talking about this, guys, for you know, probably 10 years now. We're still hoping it's going to change. It might be the year or the next couple of years where things could change uh, our way to make it a bit more uh, interesting and having to raise the bar in terms of what return you know, equivalent we need to get on our business. Whether it be sustainable, uh, th the one thing that we talked about yesterday, you and I, is you know, is there, you know, there's fatigue, but is there enough fear, is there enough recognition that something has to change uh, fundamentally in the industry? And will there be always a first mover, the first cheater, the first mover advantage, people trying to get to, to preempt everything else? That's always, we've been notoriously bad at this, guys, over our, our careers, you know, not all of us have varied degree in different times, and hopefully that may be a bit different. I think that we're, there's a lot more scrutiny now in what we do every day. There's no doubt that our investors and, uh, and you guys and everybody is really looking at, uh, you know, at uh, what we do every day in a much more, you know, increased uh, focus, which should make us a bit more careful in what we do. Great. I think we talked about pricing. How about terms and conditions? Do you think there will be some tightening on the terms and conditions going forward? Uh, maybe Kevin? Um, it's the same thing. Yeah. Whether you're providing broad cover at the same price or restrictive cover at the same price, it's e either way it has an effect on margin. So I think it'll be a combination of applying appropriate um, terms and conditions and appropriate pricing. There's things in the market that are happening that I think will provide challenges to some of the wordings that are being used. Um, I think people, frankly, with Maria will be more precise as to whether there's Puerto Rico's included or not included. I think cyber is being challenged in different ways as to whether it's going to be a separately covered peril or embedded in other products. So I think as these things create uncertainty into the practices in the market, there'll be both a shift in price and a shift in terms and conditions. But in, in our mind, it's, 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 it's the same thing. Either way, the margin is either higher or lower through price or terms and conditions. Mike? Yeah, we, we were already seeing um, positive movement in terms of conditions. They, they had been deteriorating significantly. They often kind of lead the way of price down. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that this triggered a recognition of bottom, I think on terms and condition, there had already been meaningful industry pushback over the last mm, two years or so. And I think that now accelerates just the same as price. Not from my perspective. I think so. I think the same way you get, uh, you know, you go to an underwriter when the, you want a price decrease of 10%, and the underwriter says, well, I cannot show a 10% rate decrease. Well, give me some extra conditions over here that, you know, is a bit more silent. That's certainly a dynamic that happens in the marketplace. I would expect fully the reverse when things go the other way for a broker or a you know, client to see a 20% rate increase and, well, I know I can't pay that much. I'll work with you over the next two, three years. I'll give you 12% increase and I'll just you know, exclude flood or sublimit BI or something. I mean, there'll be some pushback and forth. I think it's uh, because, you know, even though those expansion of coverages are not the culprit to where we would have, you know, uh, significant losses, they certainly curtail and, and cut the exposure going forward. So I think it should be, they typically work hand in hand. And it, uh, our rule of thumb at Arch is that typically the terms and conditions sort of more than double the rate effect. So we should have very much the same way on the upswing for the rates. Great. I think we talked about the reinsurance market in general. We talked about the terms and conditions and uh, whether it's going to be impacting global or just local uh, uh, regions. So the uh, retro market has also been uh, a major player within the reinsurance market, specifically in the prop cap, whether influenced by, let's say, the alternative capital that it's participating significantly in this, uh, in this uh, you know, growing you know, uh, market. Uh, how do you think you know, the uh, the, ultra, the uh, retro market will react given the, the, the losses that are, you know, 
uh, uh, going to, uh, to, impact, to impact it uh, in, uh, in terms of how uh, it would affect pricing at the upcoming renewals? Maybe, uh, Kevin, you want to address that? Sure. Um, the retro market was heavily impacted in the events of, of the third quarter. And a lot of that impact is with the collateralized markets. That's one of the reasons there's so much uncertainty in the market is because of whether there's capital that is prepared to come back in at 1-1. I think thinking the retro market is going to change in a pricing uh, dynamic is probably inconsistent the way we think about it. Retro will be a different product in 2018, and people will use it differently to protect what was in 2017, probably more income statement protection, and at least for us, we'll probably use retro more for balance sheet protection, because we're going to reshape our portfolios. So to think retro prices go up from 20 to 30 percent isn't necessarily the way we think about it. We will restructure our entire retro, our trading account retro, based on what we can purchase, which best optimizes our portfolio. So I think we will also likely shift from being a large buyer of seeded to a large writer of retro should the opportunity be there. We've been in the past, both on our own capital and partner capital, one of the largest writers of retro. We pulled back substantially over the last few years because pricing was much more of a buyer's market than a seller's market. I'm hopeful that in 18, should things change, we'll be very active as a seller. And Mike, from your perspective? Well, so, uh, so let's start with the, with the alternative capital markets a little bit about that. Um, number one, um, do I think that the retro market or any other uh, place that the alternative capital is playing will come back in exactly the same way? No. Um, and, and do I think that they will run from the event? No. I think what they will do is they'll feather their way back in in the same way that they have before and take advantage of some of the price moves which will attract some of the alternative capital that's been in the wings onto the dance floor. So I think you've got two phenomena that are going to mean that alternative capital actually becomes more of the story over time. And I think that's an inevitable consequence over time. Now, for years, there have been a lot of traditional writers who are very nervous about this phenomenon. My attitude is I'd rather be in a marketplace that's attractive to capital than not. And the question is then, what do I do with my business model to make this availability of capital a wind at our back instead of in our face? And that first relates to what Kevin describes. Number one, what am, how am I going to reshape my utilization and whether I'm a buyer or a seller into this market? People act like it's static, like, oh no, you're going to be constrained because retro costs are going up. But I don't need retro in that form. I don't need to think that way if that's not the best alternative equation that I create from the purchase of retro to the customer. The second thing you're going to think about is what, of the, what is the mix of things I should sell now as opposed to what I sold in the market before. This is an entirely dynamic situation. And our belief is that markets that have more places to play and have the capability of earning money from putting alternative capital to work are going to be better positioned players than others. I think what's different in this market, and I totally echo what both the gentlemen said here, is it's the first time that we don't have a retro, or a bunch of companies are retro dependent. It's the very first time we've seen it in 2001. Retro was very important for people to build, shape their portfolio. They were relying on it heavily for capital. It's 05, very, very similar uh, fashion. But it just doesn't seem to be the case right now. So. I would, uh, I would say that we were thinking that it might be a retro-led push towards capital and push the whole market through, but we're not seeing or feeling it at this point. I'm having said this, we're like Kevin, we're, we're actually not a big at all writer of retro uh, coverage. Uh, we just don't see how it, it makes sense for, for our business plan, but uh, we might be open to do more. I'm sure you're the same, Mike. So, but the question is, it's whether are there any, is there anybody out there that reliant on retro to write the business or shape their portfolio. And my belief is it's not the case right now, which is very unusual for our industry. Great. Well, it seems that alternative capital has been growing significantly uh, based on the latest support from Aon Benfield, it reached about $90 billion as of, as of June 30th. Yeah. Yeah. And the question has been in the market whether, you know, this, market, this capital, whether it has been tested or not. So it seems that potentially with these events, this could be, you know, the test for the alternative capital. So from your perspective, do you think there is more capital coming into the market in terms of, you know, especially in PropCat at the, you know, the general renewal or beyond general renewal, maybe in 2018 and beyond? Maybe start with uh, Kevin. Sure. Um, 
we wouldn't have built the things that we've built at Renaissance if we didn't, like Mike had mentioned, see the long-term benefit of third-party capital. <clears throat> so we believe that it will be here for the long term. That doesn't mean the form in which it's brought to risk is going to be the same. So even for us, in 2006, almost all the capital we raised was from hedge funds. It was fast, it was an easy sell, and we were able to bring it online uh, almost immediately. Today, we have no hedge fund capital. So I think people think of this as a monolithic group of capital that comes in or out, but all capital has different appetites. Mm -hmm. The conversations that we're having with capital at this point is much more around their, it's, it's contingent on rate change. So the question we internally are looking forward to seeing the answer to over 2018, is third party capital patient or is it cheap? And if it's patient, if it's cheap, it should say 2018 will be no worse than 2017, therefore I should come into 2018. If it's patient, it's saying, I've stuck with you because rates have come down, but you've promised me a better market post event. And the response we're getting from capital is this capital is actually more patient than cheap. And I think that's going to be a, an interesting uh, realization for the market to think about how to structure vehicles going forward. Um, overall, I think there is a lot of uncertainty with where the retro capacity is, but that is a small group of the funds that are kind of heavily focused on retro. I think more broadly, this is not a test for third party capital. Cat bonds have not been materially impacted. Some of the more diversified funds have not been materially impacted. So I think there is, you know, if this was Irma coming in on the East Coast at 100 billion, I think that was a test for third party capital. This, I think, is, is, is a narrow test for some, spe for some specialized um, providers of, 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 of capital to risk. Great. Uh, Mike? Well, I'm really appreciative that Kevin gets to go first each time because he's so spot on. We can just build yeah, on it and sound smart. You know, the, the, the margin. Yeah. The, the other thing that, that I would um, add to what Kevin has said, you know, um, people start talking, I think, a bit um, sloppily about what does it mean that there's alternative capital? And, and they begin to say, well, traditional underwriting is somehow dead. Uh, my view is the front end of alternative capital is still traditional underwriting. There's the pooling of risk. What capital you match it to is no longer assumed to be your own. That's the change in thinking. It doesn't mean that the socially useful purpose of underwriting is gone. In fact, I think it will continue to grow. We're just going to have to think more uh, broadly about what it is is the best uh, counterparty to the risk that is packaged together. And it won't always be your own balance sheet. My guess is that companies will prefer to see companies that also have a balance sheet so that they can ride along and prove they're willing to eat the cooking they've created. But this notion that it's just going to be yours is I, most, I don't know, many, m many of the advanced underwriting companies that are thinking that way. Great, um, Mark? Not much to add, obviously. Well, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> The only thing I would say to just to bring a little bit of a different uh, um, aspect to it is it's still not over yet, right? I mean, you say everybody's assuming that everything's going to be fine and the market is going to pay and it's going to be moving and there's no, no problem, no issue. I mean, we still have to go through the 1-1 one, one renewal. I think there's a lot of money on the sideline, as we hear all the time, that's willing to go in, but it's always dependent on return that we're going to see. And, uh, and again, like I said earlier in my comments, um, it's still very dependent on what kind of returns alternatives these markets will have over the next 18 months. But uh, they certainly are in there talking to us and I'm sure talking to you guys as well about what are the opportunities and right now what we have to tell them and I'm not sure what you guys are telling them, but what we're telling them is we just don't, do not know what returns we're gonna be able to generate. And it's, um, you know, it's a bit problematic for, for, for them in, in, in a way, but uh, you know, maybe it get, gets more interesting, I believe in the second, first or second quarter of 2018 where we have more visibility as to where the market is. I think we'll have a more definite answer as to what is it about the alternative market. So. One thing I'd like to expand on something Mike said is I think the value of underwriting. I think underwriting has traditionally been the assumption of risk. Now it's, it's you know, in our vernacular, it's, it's finding desirable risk and matching it with efficient capital. And as Mike's saying, it's no longer assumed that's our own capital. And I think when we think about the world, there's, there's kind of an operational efficiency quest that's going on in kind of the supply chain. And then there's, there's our belief is, is the value quest. 
And an operational efficiency, I think, is self, leads to self-destructive behavior because it's easily replicated by others and ultimately will inure to the benefit of the buyer, just reducing the margin available for, for services and capital. I think from an underwriting perspective, that, that is a value transfer to capital and to risk that I think can inure to stronger margins for those that bring the strongest skills to intermediate that risk and capital. Uh, Mike, I have a question for you. Since so you said you want to go first, it's from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my point. <laughs> so uh, some of the audience uh, asked, do you think the brokers understand that the market needs to change in the same way as reinsurance, reinsurers do? Well, I, I want to be kind to my broker friends. Um, I, I would say that there is a, there's a substantial issue um, in the way of progress. Um, and I, I think it's one of the reasons that I agree with Mark that this plays out over time. This will not be a one-one, oh my gosh. This will be a play out over time. It will roll across the sectors. And that is the inexperience of our workforces relative to this kind of market. There's a great number of brokers and a great number of underwriters who have never had to tell a client the price was higher. That's a really difficult and different task than just fighting over how far down it will go. Now, we actually started training programs with our underwriters back about a year, year and a half ago, realizing that the course we were on was unsustainable and knowing something would happen, mm -hmm. and who knows what, mm -hmm. and we started doing some training. But we weren't even all the way through our underwriter community before now, here we are. So uh, I think for the broker community, uh, you know, when I talk to the top of the houses at the broker community, I get grudging agreement. Not, not perfect agreement, of course, but grudging agreement. Look, yeah, we get it. But when I talk at the middle or, or I hear the stories from the, from the Lloyd's uh, box, I hear stories that don't match up with that conversation. And I have to keep uh, working to create buddy systems with our most experienced underwriters who've been through cycles and those who haven't so that they understand what comes next. But uh, I, I would say that there is grudging agreement in the broker community too. And just like in our own shops, it isn't fully translated to an understanding across all of our, uh, all of our people about what comes next. And that's a job for each of our firms to execute to theirs as well. Uh, Mark? Couldn't agree more. I think that uh, to Mike's point, when you talk and close doors with the most senior brokers, they understand that things need to change. And, uh, and but the, 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 the the line that's very hard for them to walk is that they represent clients. They try to get the best term and condition for their clients. So it takes time to, to broker that to your clients as well as the reinsurance community. So they're trying to find a way to get the middle ground in all this. Um, and I think they also went through a tough time in terms of pressure. I mean, they also have margin pressures themselves. The market's going down. It's going up for them as well, right? Their pricing, their, their compensation is tied to premium. So it does matter to them in a way that you know, market probably needs to change. They've been under pressure for a while and they're gonna have to sell it, but it takes time to sell it. And nobody wants to be the first one. No broker wants to be the first one to say, yeah, it's gonna be a 15% rate increase. So they're gonna wait and see. I mean, everyone wants to be the first one to say it's gonna be minus 10. <laughs> of course, that's what they do. But brokers have to be careful because they really wanna get the best deal for their clients. And that, that's what they should be doing. I think we're gonna have to wait until very late in the game to see what they're gonna be doing. But I think they recognize and are starting to make the point we're buyers here and sellers of reinsurance, actually, and they're doing, you know, telling the similar, a very similar conversation with us on both sides of the, of the, of the house. So that's sort of where it seems to be emerging from their perspective. Great. Half, half of our office in London is millennial. So, you know, as an underwriter, we should expect that we spend most of our time in a soft market and you know, sporadic hard markets emerge. So for the millennials, what we had to do is put them all in a room, and then we sent them a text as to how to raise price. <laughs> we have no millennials. We, just, we took care of it. <laughs> we have nobody. No, just kidding. All right, so let's uh, switch gear a little bit. Um, in terms of the, uh, the cat losses, it seems that uh, based on some uh, estimated uh, you know, uh, industry insured losses, about $100 billion. But then when you uh, when you look at you know, companies reporting uh, their third quarter earnings and, and pre-announcements uh, in terms of their potential losses from these events, it seems that the mat doesn't add up. So you have about $40 billion of insured losses reported by insurance and reinsurance companies. 
Um, but then you may probably look at maybe some alternative capital, having a, a share of that, uh, maybe uh, let's say another uh, 18 billion on top of that, maybe some restatement premiums that influence the, uh, the, uh, the reduction of some uh, reported net losses, but still there is a gap there between you know, the estimated losses by the modeling agencies and what the companies have been reporting. So maybe I'll start with, should I go with Mike or Kevin? You tell me. <laughs> I, well, we were, uh, we were questioned when we put out our estimate across the storms of kind of 75 to 90 billion. Um, we saw questions out there about, uh, gee, maybe they're picking that number so they'll have to report a smaller loss. Well, first of all, uh, since we are quite active in the market, that was a, a substantially ground up number with the exception of Maria, which was still quite a wild card at the time. Um, and I have to say, there's nothing we have seen since we put that number out that changes our view of the magnitude of those, those three events. So um, that the market seems to be settling in with posted numbers, and the later people have reported, the numbers have come down. I saw Hiscox just mm -hmm. revised their pick downward. Um, I think uh, the next time we say a number, you might want to believe us. I guess we can only talk about our book of business. I mean, that's the one we know well, and you'll hear from all of us that the numbers we put out is a number that we think is the right number, right? Oops. And uh, and to Mike's point, I think there's no reason for us to believe that uh, it's going to be any different, you know, in one quarter from now. Um, it's just very difficult to to evaluate, and and we're coming around to even expanding the the possibility to well, maybe it's not a sixty or eighty billion. Maybe it is. No, I'm sorry, eighty to one hundred billion. Maybe it's less than this, and maybe. It's concentrated uh, in certain players who haven't reported or will not be reporting or will just learn late in the game. Or maybe there's a lot of uninsured losses. Maybe there's a lot of uninsured losses in, in Puerto Rico that will not be an insured loss. I mean, it looks like a big economic loss, granted, but it may not be necessarily insured. So it's a very, um, uh, you know, I, if you go back to 05, I think the number, the, the losses were coming through fast, much more faster and furiously than it is coming in, in, this, in this year. So. Companies do not, uh, I believe, purposely withhold losses on their balance sheet. I think they have to recognize what they have because that's what, that's what we are all about as, as a public, publicly traded company. So, so maybe there's a possibility in my mind that the insured loss is not as big as people think it is. So I'm just going to throw it out there. Kevin? Um, in any loss, there's uncertainty, so we all know that. I, I think if, if looking at each of the events, I think Irma is probably the most traditional, mm -hmm. you know, um, cat, where you know moderate wind speeds outside outside of keys and pretty broad damage. You kind of know how the models are going to behave for that. Each of the other ones, I think there is uncertainty between the model and what actually can happen. Even for us, if you take Mexico, where the earthquake in Mexico City happened, we have an expectation of liquef uh, li liquefaction just because of the soil composition there. That may not occur, and that usually takes a long time mm -hmm. for that to be recognized with substructure compromise. Um, Harvey, I think, you know, is obviously much more of a flood event than a wind event. I think there's limitations on the model's ability to, to provide valuable imp, uh, feedback on that. I think one of the things we're looking forward to see if there's large risk losses that come out of Harvey. You know, were the flood sublimits sufficient or will there be some large surprises that come out? And then I think the real wild card is Maria. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to think about a loss of that magnitude with that substantial of an infrastructure um, impairment. And, you know, if you look at that, I think the tail for that to get worse is, is much longer than the tail for that to get better. So I think each of these is a little bit different, but ultimately I do think there is a substantial amount of loss coming to the market. Um, but it's, you know, it'll take time for each of these things to be either realized or not. And, and I, this, this goes to psychology. So let, let's say the top of it, our range, which is becoming the lower end of others' ranges of 90-ish, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. were to be the number. Um, first, I'm amused by the idea that that now is a small loss. <laughs> and, and, and one thing I watched that was really ironic, so the industry was gathered in Monte Carlo um, as, uh, as uh, Irma was coming on shore. And, and the mood of that meeting, uh, you, now you have a Category 5 bearing down on Miami for days and days, and the mood of that meeting was going straight downhill, right? And then it shifts a few degrees to the west, and the mood of the meeting wildly lightens. 
And you're thinking to yourself, now wait a minute, we, but, but here's what happened, right? Harvey, as a water event, emerges slowly. People don't really realize the drama of the event because they're all so relieved that it went ashore at a relatively unpopular area. So now we're going, okay, uh, Harvey's okay, but we don't even understand that we know from Sandy that it's going to be bad. Then Irma takes a little shift, you know, and everybody goes, whew, that's a relief. And then, and then of course, Maria, full on, first time since the 1920s on to Puerto Rico. And, and the losses don't emerge yet, as Kevin correctly says, um, to the degree. So, so everybody takes a bit of a, a deep breath. But then when they go home and start counting it all up, they realize, wow. Not, not that, wow, we had no losses. Wow, we had a lot of loss. And we spent days thinking it could have been much worse. So anybody who thinks that as that number ticks down, the possibility of rate change ticks down is losing the thread of the plot. Underwriters are awoken to risk, and they're not going to go back to sleep. I think that's a good Most of the learning, I think, was done when Irma looked like a Cat 5 going into Miami. And I think only an underwriter can know that the feeling that one had as that was coming in as to whether they really had a handle on the risk that they were taking. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, you know, when, we, when we were watching that storm come in and you know, it, it was coming in from the south. So, you know, each couple degrees was, was a different emotional response. And I was looking at it, if it did come in, you know, the devastation would have, been, would, would have been horrendous to see it go up the east coast. But the, 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 I'm not sure how the market, the, the local Florida market and would have responded. And I think the role of reinsurance would have been even that much more important in restoring the Florida, um, Florida to, 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 you know, back to, a stable footing. Um, so it, you know, it's kind of a, a, an interesting time, but I think that's when the learning occurred more than with seeing you know, whatever number in the third quarter of losses. Great. Uh, just staying with the theme of uh, prop cat exposures, I mean, as part of our surveillance process, we do collect, let's say, uh, those exposures on, let's say, uh, on a consistent manner, and also uh, we have defined the zones, so we'll be able to compare, uh, let's say, companies uh, in terms of their exposures. But when you open 10Ks for publicly traded companies, it seems that the industry, there's no standard in terms of how it reports uh, their prop cut exposure. And for an external, whether investor or analyst, it's hard for them to, let's say, uh, have, let's say, apple to apple type of comparison, and also uh, try to, uh, uh, let's say, size the potential losses uh, maybe I'll start with you, Kevin, with, uh, in terms of whether the industry should probably standardize the way they report their cat exposures or this is or whatever, you know, the existing uh, uh, disclosures are fine. So you know, we work hard to tr provide transparent uh, information about the risks that we're taking, both in our reports and also in our, our earnings calls. I think um, there is no simple number. So I think what you're saying is, you know, an analyst to be able to put a number on a spreadsheet and compare a company to a company, that doesn't provide insight as to the way in which a portfolio is constructed. So w w it's long been our belief that putting out a PML or something as a simple measure to give relative um, understanding across companies is not adequate. And for what would be required for an adequate understanding across companies is too much of a competitive advantage for us to give a roadmap for our competitors. So I think it's one where it's a delicate balance for having those that give you capital understand the risk that one's taking, but it's also one in which it's not a simple business that can be reduced to a one in a hundred PML for something. So we believe that the disclosures that are out there are adequate, um, and it's something that there is such nuance to the way portfolios are constructed that it's difficult to come up with simple measures. I couldn't agree more with, with Kevin. I think that it's, it's a false um, sense of security. I mean, we have losses, you know. In the aggregate, we're getting to 90 million, but even, even each and every one of them, which is less than 30 billion, roughly, right, there's a huge variability around these losses in and of itself. So even small losses, we can't even get, get right. So I think, I'm with Kevin, I think that you try to do the best you can, you know, describing what you do and how you do this, and I think time is the only thing that really will prove you right or wrong. I mean, I know it's not, a great answer for investors. But, you know, every company will have different dial, will actually put different switches in the way they do the model, will have different appetite, will disagree with some of the modeling agencies. And, 
And that's an important piece of underwriting, right? It's an important piece of how you go about your business providing risk and, and protection. So I don't, you know, it'd be nice. Everything is, you know, sounds nice to have, uh, you know, uh, you know, a very similar way to look at the, uh, the risk on a property cap basis, but we've been doing casualty business forever and ever. We've done, and there's no standardized way to look at it the right way, where I would argue that premium is the wrong measure. I mean, we could all argue. So even those very basic things that we've done for hundreds of years, we're not finding a way to, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to live with uncertainty and ambiguity as an industry. And I think that's, uh, that's where you, you, know, you have differentiating, and that's what makes a market. You have different people with different opinions. What, what risk is, is all about, and uh, that's what it's going to have to be. That's well, my view. And, my and both of these answers lead back to the false precision of models. Exactly. You know, in, in all of these environments, the only thing we know is the model will be wrong, and we'll learn from this episode, and the model might get slightly better. Yeah. And, and, and until we accept that that's at the bottom, um, we demand more and more false precision on top. And that actually leads to misleading outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, here, you know, I'll, I'll bow in your direction for a second. Because of the um, confidential nature of our relationship, you're actually able to look under the hood and then relate to the public whether or not what a company said it was going to do is done. That's a pretty big role for y'all, and, and I think it's an important role that doesn't destroy the um, desired outcome of companies competing with one another. Um, so I, th I think that's one of the places people should look. Yeah, no. Uh Appreciate your answer. Just in terms of, let's say, as a follow-up, um, when there is a loss, and I think referring to uh, uh, Ben's comment earlier at the, at the opening remarks, so each each event is unique. Of course, you know, whether there's a flood or uh, the speed, of, you know, the wind, and maybe it takes you know weeks uh, to 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 get an estimate. Mm -hmm. But you create that uncertainty in the market, and potentially there's a volatility in your stock price. So what is the, let's say, the, the balance, whether, you know, uh, should, should we, sh should we pre-announce or should we give a range or should we at least, you know, give some sense of, let's say, comfort to the, you know, to the external, uh, to external parties? Because it, it seems that when there is a, a major event, of course, it depends on, on the severity and the, and, and, the, and the profile of the event. It takes sometimes weeks uh, for certain companies, especially companies that have strong ERM, so you think you know they do have strong risk controls in place, and you would expect them to at least you know uh, come up with some uh, kind of uh, range to somewhat give that comfort to the to the market. I don't know uh, who wants to take that first. I'll start a little bit, and uh, you guys can pick me up. Um, I, I think all these ideas are, sound great, and they're you know even as managers we're looking for this, we're looking for consistency, you know things that are very much looking the same. And you're talking to three companies here who are very specialty focused, and we're not you know, homeowners or, you know, even that has its own issues or personal auto. We're, we're working in the specialty world with a lot of uncertainty and the pro, uh, there's no consistency. There's, there's no homogeneous book for business that any one of us can really put together. So uh, I think what you're going to have to, what we're going to have to realize, and I think we're realizing it, and we're, this is the operating uh, principle, is that we do the best we can in, in managing the balance sheet, managing the risk. and that we try and divulge and share with the world as much as we know at the time we know it. Um, I think it's very, very difficult to expect us to have a homogeneous book of business and know, know on the button what the losses are going to be. I think even the, you know, the modeling agencies, also the modeling vendors, do not have themselves a very you know, homogeneous uh, package to begin with. So, I mean, that's what makes it fun, right? That's what makes the industry fun. If we had everything locked in, right, put buttoned down and, and lined up and squared, I mean, I wouldn't be here. It'd be boring as hell. And what would I be, you know, having fun? This is the fun of competition, right? And figure things out and make it better and try to get an improvement. And our product, people forget, is a very, very complex product. I know people think insurance is, is boring, and it is in some ways, but insurance, <laughs> life insurance, for instance, but insurance. <laughs> Personal auto. Anyway, <laughs> PNC insurance specialty that we do here, I think there's never a day, and I'll speak on for, for myself, there's never a day where I don't learn something. So you know, it's such a very interesting, intricate, our clients are all different, they're all different needs, they all have different aspects, different risk characteristics. And so you're asking us from the outside something that we even ourselves are you know, fighting with or at least you know, grappling with every day to try to make it more consistent. And you, then you realize that there's no way you can do it, right? At Archer Arch Insurance, we have 14 different segments 
43 different lines of business within those. I mean, and every one of them is very different from one another, different dynamics, different coverages and, and whatnot. That's what makes it fun, interesting, challenging, I would say at times. Yeah. But uh, so, so to ask for consistency in reporting and, and looking at the risk from our perspective is, is too difficult. I, I don't think it's, it, this is what we're all about. And I think it's gonna be very difficult to attain it. You know, you can put all the AI, all the Googles of the earth you know, on this one. It's still a human enterprise, still a human industry. And there's gonna be a lot of you know, differences uh, you know, in the way it's done. That's, that's my, you know, my soapbox for two seconds, so go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <Hey. laughs> uh, just a couple of things. Um, first, uh, the, the marketplace should want us um, to be competitive mm -hmm. and not homogeneic. That's right. We are curating complex books of business mm -hmm. towards what we think will be the optimum portfolio. Mm -hmm. And that has to start with what you start with, and it has to work from what you know, and, and there's constraints, and it, it makes it a very, very interesting way of life. You know, I gotta tell you, every year for the last five years or so, whenever I'm meeting with a group of underwriters, they're just groaning and in despair. Every day is a slog just to avoid losing five more points at rate. La, la, la. And now, they're all like, oh my gosh, this is horrible, I don't know what to do. It's like, really? This is your market right here, pal. If you, if you don't enjoy this part, you shouldn't be in the business. Because this is exactly where we start discovering real pricing for rate and we get moving to the question that was first asked. Um, look, it is a very difficult judgment and one that every company has to take with utmost seriousness. Mm -hmm. When is it I know so much that I should tell the public? Because that is a moment of truth that is remembered and viewed with great interest. Mm -hmm. And so um, the idea that good ERM would lead you to report that much more quickly would suggest that um, we don't know that the models are imperfect. The very first ERM look is gonna be a highly modeled look, right? But we have the advantage of having real claimants and real activities. Mm -hmm. So we would never just go on the model look. We saw that with the modeling companies. I mean, the, 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 the bizarreness of having the difference we saw between one and the other estimate of Maria so quickly out there when we as underwriting companies knew there was no way anybody knew anything was shocking. And there's the models, right? So if we're just gonna go driven right off of models, first we'd have to have consistent models, which we don't. And none of us use the model, well at least not serious underwriting shops don't use the models purely. They have their own modifiers on the models through their own experience of book. And then we have real information to use. So why wouldn't we wait? until we felt we had that right mix of model information and direct information from the ground before we would want to go out to our shareholders and put a stake in the ground. That's the only, that's the only right way to do it from my point of view. And frankly, sure, um, you're learning too because as companies start coming out, they reach that point of comfort in different ways for different reasons. But then you're able to triangulate a bit as well. So, you know, being first, I don't think there's any prize for it. If you happen to know first, you really feel you know, you should go out there whether you're alone or not. Um, but it is generally better for companies to get more information before they go out and rush to market. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, it's, in some ways, this is a discussion between timing and precision. And if you take timing to, a, to it's an extreme, it's, well, we should be reporting when, when you have the parameters of a storm approaching Miami. It's because this may happen. That's, that is the, the extension of timing. Precision is wait until you have the last claim paid. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do is marry the two, and we use every tool that we have to come up to a point where we think we have enough confidence to come out and give, give a reasonable estimate as to the financial impact. So I think it's, it's, it's no simple way to do it, and it's, it's an art. There's, there's the science that comes in that supports it, but at the end of the day, these are all judgments. Great. And, and Puerto Rico remains the best example. I, agree. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of things about Puerto Rico uh, are going to play on a couple of factors that will still unveil themselves. Well, we've got a best estimate out there. We told the world at the time, and we believe it now. Still uncertain. But what are some of the drivers? N number one, you know, you have a, a really massive and horrible yeah. Uninsured element. Very true. Yeah, that's true. Every time we hear that there's a large storm, especially in a developed economy, yeah. 
where there is a huge gap between underinsured and the, the economic value and the insurance value, we should all be ashamed. I agree with that. We have so much more we can offer society if we got off our butts, worked with these governments, got some of these dumb government programs shut down, and got the job done. And a lot more people would be a lot better off. So that's the first place you got to look is under insurance. The second one is, you know, I don't know about you, but, but the degree of uh, questionable government decisions that have already been made in Puerto Rico is a little bit astonishing. I mean, that, that little uh, crowd they hired to fix the electrical grid, uh, huh? You know, and, and, and meanwhile, in Florida, it's, it's kind of job done, Texas, job done. And, and there, those crews were waiting to be asked and weren't asked. So, you know, you could wind up with some tail just out of the government response or the ineptitude of government response, depending on what evolves from here. That, that's something I, I know we probably didn't price in very precisely. Yeah, so we'll be coming to the audience in a few minutes uh, for questions uh, directly using uh, the microphone. Um, so uh, going back to, let's say, the return on, on equity, uh, of course, 2017, uh, the returns will be depressed because of the cat losses, mm -hmm. obviously. But let's say going forward, I mean, historically, the reinsurance or the Bermudians, at least, were generating return equity in general on, on, on aggregate uh, and high single digit. But then let's say in 2008, uh, what type of, let's say, ROI should we expect from the industry? 18, I mean. 18. Maybe more. You, have to, you have to give us a rate change to really make it, you know, make a judgment, a judgment on this one. I think that we tell, we tell on the call that, um, you know, right now if you look at a 10 to 15 percent rate increase across uh, the property cat exposed business, so that just that piece of the market, we think the rates are going to go from, you know, eight, seven to eight to maybe nine, nine and a half. So it's not a significant increase. Uh, it's going to be, it's better than, you know, five or six, but it's, uh, it, it's going to take a while to filter it through. And the issue with 2018, uh, as you just pointed out, is we're going to need a whole cycle of renewal. So we're going to take a whole year, year and a half to see the full impact. So we're not going to feel, as an industry, the impact of that return until 2019, really, in truth. On the reinsurance, we get quicker, a bit yeah. quicker, uh, because you get, you know, loss occurring, it's one year basis. But to get the whole, you know, return dynamic, you know, fully functioning, we're going to get to 2019. Uh, at the same time, I'm not sure what, what you guys are saying, but what we're seeing on the, the non-property cat exposed lines right now, such so as DNO and excess professional, I mean, we're still seeing rate decreases in those areas. So this is not giving us significant, um, you know, return either. So again, in the timing sequence that we talked about earlier, maybe we'll get there by middle of 2018, which will again affect probably 2019 and 2020. So we're uh, we, we tell our board of directors, we tell our investors, don't expect, you know, significant pickup in returns, even if we get some rate increase for, you know, 18 months. I think it's going to take a while to play, to play out, which is good because once it plays out, it sticks there and it's, it's actually a good uh, it's some momentum being built that will hopefully create some momentum for 2020, 21, 22. So that's what we're hoping will happen. So guys, you got to... Yeah, totally. That, totally. That, that is the right way to think about it. You, you, first of all, some of 1-1 was done. So you're not going to capture that bit, uh, especially if you're working in the international property arena um, on the insurance side. Um, so you, you know, you, it's just going to it's going to bleed in over time. So the first year's ROEs are not going to be dramatically lifted by this. I think there'll be some progress. It'll be relatively insignificant. Looked at on a fully earned basis, it'll mean a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're really going to see the wave come in. Just think of Florida. You know, Florida fundamentally renews it to what seven one. So it, we don't even know today what that'll look like. And by the time that happens, you get very little of the benefit in 18. So it, it seems to me that, the, that this is a evolving event. But back to the point we started with, you know, the debate of how far and how wide. This is why it goes further than people think. Because as you begin to see progress in one line of business, first, it'll attract some of your capital to there and away from less well-priced um, lines. And as a result, that less scarce capital will demand more return. Because the one line of business that was making it all look better than it was, as mm -hmm. it was deteriorating mm -hmm. along, was the absence of cats in property cat. Now that that's revealed as incorrectly calculated, it lays everything else bare. And at a time when the kind of 2002, 2003, 2004 driven reserve releases are run gone. 
So you, you just have a completely different equation as a manager, a completely different expectation from your investors. You're going to see this. And the fact that it won't be wildly satisfying at first will actually add momentum mm -hmm. yep. rather than some kind of sudden correction following by a drift down. And that can place us in the marketplace that Kevin has correctly suggested the industry should aspire to, one that is less volatile, more sustainable, and more aligned with correct pricing over the cycle, for not without cycle, but less volatile for our clients. That's a better world for every participant in the market. Kevin? So when I look, I look at the world in two lenses for, for Renaissance. One is the instructions we give our underwriters and then what we do to manage our, 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 our capital. The, the portfolios that we build, we pro forma 2018 out, and in that pro forma is a positive rate change. That positive rate change results from really two primary drivers. One is the cost of that economic capital is higher. Mm -hmm. The primary reason the economic capital model is higher is, is because of the, the cheapest capital in 17 that was, in, that was embedded in that model was retro. That is restructured and costs more. Yeah. Um, secondly, the opportunity cost of putting capital to work is greater. So that must therefore support that we think there's opportunities further in time. So we've got that as far as what we're looking for the, for the underwriters to achieve. For, from, from an actual perspective, thinking of the holding company, the, the dividend between that price that we achieve and the cost of our capital is the return that we have. And I think we've worked hard looking to restructure our debt, restructure our preferreds, so that the capital that we're bringing to the market on an owned basis, and certainly the capital we're bringing on a non-owned basis, is as cheap as possible. That will inure to the benefit of our stakeholders and our shareholders. So I think we're in a mode where we should begin to see rising margins and rising returns, but it's, it's depending on the way in which you're structuring your portfolio, it can take some time. Great. So now we'll turn to the audience. If you have any questions, there's one hit up front. Can we get a microphone, please? Thank you, Elise Greenspan with Wells Fargo. So my question um, you know, just relates to taxes, obviously very topical over the last week and you know, very important in terms of the landscape in Bermuda. If each of you guys just have initial views just on the tax reform that's been proposed in the US, how it changes the Bermuda landscape and just any um, you know, high level views specific to your individual companies. Thank you. I'll take it. Well, I'll, I'll start uh, since my first career was in that world, um, I have to say that one of the words that's most important to emphasize in your question is proposed. You know, the legislative calendar is a cruel thing, and complex legislation usually takes um, a run-up of practice of something like a decade before it can get passed. And they're trying to do this thing with a run-up of practice of a few months. Um, it remains to be seen whether there's change at all. And the second thing I would note is that the, um, the false patriotism of asking your country to put up a tax barrier in order to make more money for your shareholders at the expense of your citizens paying more for their insurance is a strange form of patriotism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a world where capital is global and where the best solutions to problems are shared across the globe, perhaps nowhere demonstrated more efficiently than reinsurance, to deprive your citizens of the benefit of that system strikes me as a strange decision. And it strikes me because it's such a strange decision as one that is unlikely in the end to be made. Now having said that, even if the package passed, the totality of benefit that comes from operating in one of the world's great insurance and reinsurance centers does not go away. It just changes in value, but not very much. One thing I would add, too, is I think there's a focus on what the U.S. is doing, and it's my belief that whenever there's a tariff put up in one location, responses come with tariffs from other locations. So I think thinking of this as putting the U.S. on a permanent preferential footing may change as other uh, economic communities or countries respond. Mike McGavick for Congress, that's what I would say. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I think. That's what I think. That's my story. <laughs> That idea has been tried and <laughs> no more. 
So we, given that we have only a couple of minutes left, um, I'll probably the last question, probably I'll start with Kevin, your outlook on the reinsurance sector for the next 12 months. Actually, I, I love this business. So um, I, I, you know, I kind of whistle to work every day and I'm looking out at 2018 and I think there's great opportunities for us to bring new products, bring new capital and provide more value to our customers. So I'm looking at it, I think it's a relatively attractive risk return compared to what else is available, and I think on an absolute basis it's going to get better as well. Great. Uh, Mark? Neutral to slightly positive. Great. And uh, Mike, you have the last word. More, more positive. I, 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 uh, I think to have underwriters reawoken is a big deal. And from there, I think we can get to things that are more sustainable for clients, more predictable over the cycle for clients. That's so much better than the system we've been living in. So the fact that this change is an opportunity not just to you know, have better rate, but to also kind of reestablish how this mechanism works, that's a very powerful opportunity that should be seized by the underwriting community and not left to make. Thank you. So uh, please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists. And now we're going to...